Hello, my name is Zoe Romine, and today I'm going to be doing a presentation on the disturbance among the suburbs, and I'm going to be discussing the evolution from suburbs like Levittown into suburbs like Irvine, California, and the differences in culture and urban planning. So it's important to note what the original draws to the suburbs during the suburban sprawl were in the 1950s. Uh, and one of the main parts was many veterans were coming back from World War II and the government, as an attempt to ensure that veterans had a place to live and that there would be less strikes, um, they created the GI Bill, which essentially helped them to pay their mortgage and helped them pay for college. And also, under the actions of the Federal Housing Administration, it was much easier for people to afford a house, um, and to an extent it was cheaper than renting for many people. So it gave many people the opportunity to settle down outside of the city. And it's also important to note why many people were looking to leave the city. Um, parts of it had to do with media that would encourage people to live out this suburban ideal and it also had to do with many of the living conditions during the Great Depression. Uh, many people had grown up with terrible conditions, not very much money, and now that they had given the opportunity to live in the suburbs and outside of the city, they found that that would be a great opportunity. Another aspect of moving to the suburbs was white flight and the idea of leaving behind many of the immigrants that had come in uh, and many people wanted the exclusivity of whiteness in the suburbs. And an important person who was able to fulfill this need for housing was William Levitt, who was a real estate developer in Long Island, New York in the 1940s and 50s. And essentially he became the face of mass housing in the suburbs. And he created places like Levittown. He created a few of these places and he notably was able to create a 26-step process that resulted in houses being created every 16 minutes and they were these cookie cutter houses that were mass produced and they were able to be sold for relatively cheap because they were so easily produced so they were sold for around seven thousand to eight thousand dollars and modern day that would be roughly $78,000 to $90,000, which is still relatively cheap. Um, this is incredibly reminiscent of General Motors style, Henry Ford style manufacturing and development, which is really important to note that this is the style and the demand that was necessary to complete these sort of suburban ideals. So impacts from this were not just developmental, but also cultural. Uh, we see that even outside of the mass development of these houses, that early suburbs that were able to provide for this sort of demand were reflecting this overwhelming desire to move outside of the city and create an entirely new culture of whiteness and uh, utopia, essentially. Um, it was able to push this sort of consumerism and car culture that were able to profit off of each other, where the suburbs were able to profit off of consumerism and car culture, and consumerism and car culture were able to profit off of suburban ideals. And essentially, culture within suburbia was centered around young white people. It was uh, built to support young white families that wanted to leave the city and leave people of color and immigrants back in the cities. And we can see here from William Levitt that he explained that he didn't sell to African American people because he viewed it as something that was not his problem and that he was focused on the housing aspect of Levittown. So coming out of this major boom of the suburban sprawl in the 1950s, there was this new form of urban development um, 
that was accommodating this influx of residents that needed new amenities such as office spaces and parks and so eventually these amenities grew to incorporate a lot more than would be in a traditional suburban area and these places became known as satellite cities or edge cities and a major example of this is Irvine, California, which is our neighbor up north, and it is a satellite to both Los Angeles and Newport Beach. And it started out quite small, but it ended up growing to be really, really massive. As you can see in the graphic on the left, it is shown that Irvine is a major aspect of the density of Orange County, and Orange County is just below in density uh, to San Francisco and it shows just how impactful this urban development is uh, that we're going to be getting to that is in Irvine. So a major aspect of Irvine was the master plan and in the 1960s um, the Irvine company was able to really lock in this sort of urban development and Specifically in 1960, uh, the company president, Charles S. Thomas, announced the city plan and it was described as being this cluster of communities now known as villages that were connected by parks and recreation and uh, offices that originally was estimated to cost $13.5 billion, which in modern day value is $120.8 billion. And... Um, by 1980, it was expected to have 300,000 people, which it has almost reached at this point. Um, the original plan for Irvine was intended to center around UCI, UC Irvine, um, and it was originally intended to be 10,000 people, and it was supposed to be a small college town, and that very clearly changed to accommodate different purposes and accommodate a new suburban style. And as we can see from the company president in 1960, he intended for this to be a massive metropolis. He intended for it to be really different from everything we've seen before this. And the architect, William L. Pereira, designed it to reflect an intersection between suburbia and urban planning. And he wanted it to be everything that the city was, but reflect suburban ideals um, and he wanted it to encompass all the amenities and efficiency that you would find in a city. And an important aspect of the possibilities of doing this was the Irvine Company and the Irvine Company was able to really do this by being privatized. Um, and this land was bought out by the Irvine Company in the 1870s from a collection of land grants. And it was passed down through the generations until it was sold uh, to Donald Brand in 19, 1977. And then in the 1990s, Donald Brand has gotten full um, ownership of the company. Uh, and Irvine, the Irvine Company uh, owns over at this point over 57,500 acres which is approximately 60 percent of Irvine Ranch and without this sort of privatization of the land Irvine would not have been able to complete this sort of master plan of uh, the community and without it it wouldn't have been able to fulfill this sort of suburban ideal that it holds today. A major aspect of what we expected out of suburbs was this sort of idea that maybe the younger generations weren't going to go into the suburbs and we see that that's not true we are seeing that millennials and gen z are both moving to the suburbs and especially during coronavirus we have seen that a lot of millennials and a lot of gen z have been going into the suburbs specifically 48 percent of millennials in 2020 uh moved to the suburbs, which is a 4% increase since 2020, and then 49% of Gen Z have moved to the suburbs, which is an 8% increase since 2019. And you can see in the graphic um, down below that almost 20% of Irvine's 
population is between the ages of 20 and 29, and very few are actually above the age of roughly 50. So we see that it is a lot of younger people that are staying in the suburbs. And as for race, the race of Irvine has become relatively well known because it is so predominantly Asian at this point. Um, and on surface level, that does seem quite good, but there has been a lot of talk as to the actual culture within Irvine and the exclusivity of whiteness in Irvine. And um, we can see that 45% of the population as of 2015 was Asian. But we can see with these quotes down on the bottom, um, the top quote is from a white woman uh, who's talking about how she has lived in Irvine for decades at this point and how she views that Asian culture has overcome the culture that she views to be a part of Irvine. And um, down below we see Christina who is a uh, Canadian with Korean descent, and she discusses how she feels that she has been ostracized because she did not easily adjust, and that places like Irvine really represent this sort of American dream sort of lifestyle um, that you need to fulfill. And we can see through this that regardless of this sort of change, that it seems very surface level. And overall, this evolution of suburbia from Levittown to Irvine is both the de developmental and cultural. And we can see that with the evolving demographics and we can see that with culture from the quotes that was mentioned earlier. And overall, this change of suburbia is incredibly impactful as to what urban planning is going to be like in the future and what we expect to see out of these changing demographics because without this sort of urban aspect to suburbia it wouldn't quite fit with these new generations moving in and places like Irvine are really holding on to that they're really moving in a direction that seems to please younger generations and through that they have the power to perpetuate these suburban ideals in a very different way than places like Levitt were able to in the 1950s and this is done both by major real estate powers and by residents. Thank you so much for your time and these are my works cited.